it's a difficult time, we have to acknowledge. And therefore, the subject of competing in this era of uncertainty requires strategists, corporate CEOs, those who plan and execute a special talent, special perspective. Today, particularly in the developed world, psychology of the people are more important than the macroeconomies. Over the last 100 years, politicians, bureaucrats, believed in macroeconomics. So if the economy is not so good, you lower the interest rate, you supply money to the market to stimulate the economy. And if uh, the economy is heated, then you would raise the interest, or else you pull the money back from the uh, marketplace. This is called the uh, macroeconomic policies. They have two levers to control the entire world economy, which is to fiddle with the interest rate and money supply. The latter is called supply side. The former is known particularly as Keynesian. Adam Smith one time said that the invisible hand of God will look after the economy. Today, I think it's the opposite. It's the invisible hand of the mass, that is you and many consumers, will control the economy. It's the psychology that will really determine the economic activities. Consumer durables in the developed world is penetrated into every household, and it's a problem because they have life. And replacement cycle, and that is to buy a new one, trading in the old one, as you do with cars. Consumer psychology is so important in durables. And among these durables, I include houses, cars, refrigerators, televisions, etc., etc. If your psychology is good, feeling great, you buy a new one. And if your psychology is not motivated, you wait for another year or two. You see, that's why economy is so much dependent on mass psychology. Europe, for example, against the financial crisis originated in the US, used the stimulation measures. Angela Merkel of Germany said, we're going to pay you 2,500 euros if you bring in the trade-in, even the junk, total, uh, totally destroyed cars. We'll give you 2,500 euros. Boom. Automobile sales went up. It's the psychology. Because if you do it this year, you get the incentive. Next year, we're not so sure, you see. This is the first example of major scale mass psychology based economic recovery. Not the recovery based on interest rate and money supply. I call this the phenomenon of sea anemone. You have seen this sea anemone? This is a picture of sea anemone. If you poke your finger on top of the anemone, it shrinks like this. And it never opens for hours on end. And this is like Japanese people are like sea anemone. Our government said so many bad things, so push the finger on top of our old people, and therefore they have shrunk and closed otherwise very wealthy purse. And therefore economy is bad. See, economy in developed country is based on psychology. Invisible hand of mass is everything. And that's because consumer durables are so sensitive to the replacement cycle. Let's assume the total volume, total population of cars is 100. And if you replace it in 10 years, each year, 
there is one, uh, excuse me, there is 10 units of automobile sales. That's the demand every year. However, if they waited for 20 years to replace their cars, annual demand is five. Five times 20 is 100. 10 times 10 is 100. It's the same population. Everyone has a car. Nobody is suffering. Nobody is giving up anything. You are just prolonging by repair and maintenance. It's the same economy, but the demand is one to two. Huge difference. And that's why you have to deal with the psychology to say, I have to buy a new car, I have to buy a new television, I have to buy a new refrigerator, I have to rebuild my house, etc. You see, that's why you as a strategist in a stagnant economy need to work with the psychology of your consumers. In what way can you persuade people to buy your products now as opposed to wait for another two years? That's the essence of strategy. Collectively, as a nation, that's the essence of ec economic stimuli method, stimulation method. Okay. And the next question, of course, is why strategists must become catalyst for change? Well, the number one reason is most CEOs who are presumably quite old do not normally have a sense or feel for it. In Japan, most demands are created by people in the 20s and 30s. In the electricity, it's by young. And the CEO must have a first-hand feel for what these consumers want. But at age 50, 55, 60, sometimes in Japan, 70, they don't have a feel for it. They don't really understand what the driving force of consumption is doing, feeling, touching. They also do not have the in-depth understanding of the critical technologies. That's another problem, and it takes time to learn something about new technology. They also lack the first-hand experience of all OECD countries, BRICS, and VISTAs. Nowadays, I started calling BRICS as BX. I have eliminated Russia from BRICS and added Indonesia. And therefore, Brazil, India, Indonesia, China. BX instead of BRICS. Because if you go to Russia today, you wonder why that country is part of the BRICS. It was okay 10 years ago when Putin came in. Doesn't look that way now. Of course, it depends on the price of the oil and gas. Vista is also quite good. Very few CEOs have first-hand experience of what these new markets are like. And therefore, it is a young strategic staff to help CEO and strategy developing functions to understand these three elements. I think we need to re-educate corporate staff. Most corporate staff maybe go to business school. Don't do that. In business school, professors teach frameworks. They have no idea. They haven't sold a pencil. They haven't sold a car, but they have studied the successful companies, 20, 30 of them, and now teach the youngsters this is the way to succeed. Well, that's a formula for 10, 20 years ago. What about now? I was teaching at Stanford Business School. Terrible. Terrible. Because kids raise their hand and says, Professor Olmeyer, What's the framework you're talking about? I'm talking about strategy. They say, unless there is a framework, we can't explain this phenomenon. But you know, the problem is, if I teach them the framework, they start thinking about their problem using that framework. 
At that moment, they are not looking at the customers, not looking at the technology. They try to explain and think through the framework they have memorized. Bad. If you have these guys in your competition, congratulations, because chances are that they will fail. You see, that's why there are business schools sharing how to think, how to look at the customers, how to come up with new ideas. No framework, but your mind can grasp the forces at work and come up with a new strategy, which I will talk about. So we have to re-educate the entire business community, particularly those who are known as corporate staff. Because in today's world, it's impossible to take advantage of the opportunities with the old frameworks. Design of global organization and global management systems. This is also a challenge. No company can succeed in becoming a global corporation without the right governance structure, without the right organization. For example, how do you deal with China? How deal, do you deal with Indonesia? How do you deal with Brazil? You see, the whole world horizon has expanded so rapidly. And with that, the right organization and staff, you don't have a global strategy. So in the end, you have to make a compromise, and that is to fit your strategy to available people. Good strategists look to customers and technology, not to framework. Customers, unless you have a feel for the customer, you can't develop a strategy. But unless you have the technology to dif differentiate yourself from competition, your competitive edge is short-lived. So you have to throw in technology element, otherwise it becomes cutthroat price competition, and you destroy your company's profit and industry profit eventually. The number one factor that determines the success of countries is the presence of an educated workforce, a skilled workforce. Mental models matter. How we think about the world and the language that we use to describe this world affects every decision that we make and affects how we and our companies conduct our business. First of all, we see what we expect to see. Anyone has ever gone to see a magician understands the truth of that. We see what we expect to see. It is not seeing is believing. It is believing is seeing. Secondly, through our own behaviors, we create self-fulfilling prophecies. If I treat you as if you are an incompetent who cannot be trusted and manage you accordingly, over time you will in fact become an incompetent who cannot be trusted. We know this. If you go to Google or your favorite website and search for the phrase self-fulfilling prophecy, you will see the literally hundreds of studies in contexts ranging from schools to the Israeli army to companies where we see that how we think about things makes them come true because of our behavior. There are studies that began this by looking at how physical attractiveness affects personality. They would do a study. People would talk to someone on the other phone, but they would not know whether that person was actually attractive or not 
they'd be shown a picture. When they were shown a picture of an attractive person, they talked to that individual in a very different way than when they were shown an unattractive picture. And that interaction, in turn, produced different behavior. We see and get what we expect. We make decisions based on our assumptions and theories about how the world works. If you actually think that the key to success is low labor costs and having no workers, you will make decisions accordingly. Which means that knowing the facts and knowing the evidence is absolutely essential to running a successful enterprise. Choose a strategy to compete in the grocery store industry. Do you want to minimize labor costs? Grocery store industry is a low margin bad industry, particularly in the United States. In 1990, Walmart began selling groceries. By today, it has a 25% market share. How do you compete? Cut your labor costs by having no people in the store and the people who are there untrained? Cut your product costs by buying huge amounts of product. Or would you staff the store generously and let every store manager, and for that matter, every department manager within a store, stock what they think the local people want to eat? Which looks more successful to you? The average US grocery store industry, which has lower margins, or a company called Whole Foods Markets which has succeeded by understanding something that no one else has yet figured out. People will pay more for food they want to eat. That may sound obvious to you, but if in fact people will pay more for food they want to eat, then you need to have stock assortments that reflect local tastes. The United States is kind of like Brazil, a big country. And regional tastes and food preferences vary. Walmart versus Costco. In 2004, the average Costco employee, which is a large warehouse seller of all kinds of merchandise, competing with Sam's Club, paid 39% more, gave a higher percentage of its employees, more benefits. Therefore, its labor costs looked higher. Which store do you think was more profitable? How can you make money if your labor costs look higher? It turns out that it doesn't matter what I pay you. It matters what you can do. If I pay you nothing and you do less, my costs are high. Turnover in the first year is less than one-third as high as Costco as in Sam's Club. They generate higher sales per square foot from their more skilled and trained and, by the way, longer-term workers. And therefore, their profits per employee are higher. Do not fall into this idea that labor costs equals labor rates and these equal profits. If you want to cut your labor costs, I can tell you how to do it perfectly. Close. On the day you close, your labor costs will be zero. They don't get any lower than that. You are not interested in minimizing your labor rates. You are interested in hiring people who can do things to make your enterprise successful and effective. Why does Toyota outperform General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler? Is it because, as many of my friends in the US talk about, Toyota doesn't have all of these retired employees that they have to pay health care and retirement for. Rick Wagoner, who got fired not soon enough, 
as the CEO of General Motors, would complain about the $1,500 per car cost disadvantage of General Motors over Toyota. It's a true number. Is it because Toyota pays less money? Is it because they're more productive? What is it? It turns out that while the labor cost disadvantage for General Motors was $1,500 per car, General Motors faced a much bigger problem. According to the Harbor Report, which is spelled H-A-R-B-O-U-R, -R, the Bible of the U.S. auto industry, in 2004, Toyota received, on average, $6,000 more per vehicle sold than General Motors. The problem of General Motors and Chrysler is not labor costs. The problem of General Motors and Chrysler was that they made cars that no one wanted to buy. There's an interesting sequel to the story. When I wrote a column about this recently, I called the Harbor Report and I said, why are have you not updated these numbers since 2004? And the answer was, gen the U.S. auto industry was so embarrassed by these numbers in 2004 that they have refused to give us the information since then. This is not just ignorance. This is the active cultivation of ignorance. I do not like the answer. I don't want the data. I will give you the name of the woman who I talked to at the Harbor Report so you can check this out. There are feedback effects. Labor rates do not equal labor costs, and labor costs do not equal profits. Southwest Airlines, which is a low-cost carrier, and as you recall, the best-performing stock over the 30 years from 72 to 2002. And as you recall, the only company that has been profitable every year in the airline industry for the last 35 years is the highest wage company in the United States. The question is not what you pay people. The question is what they do. If people are going to be around for a long time, selective recruitment for fit with the organization's culture. Do not select people for things they can learn in a minute. Select them for fundamental attributes that will never change. Invest in training and development. And then once you select people who fit the culture and you've invested in them, let them make some decisions. Decentralize and delegate decision making so that people can use their gifts and skills, and you can eliminate the layers of management whose only job is to watch people, watch other people do the work. Pay that is contingent on group and organizational, not just individual performance, so that the rewards are shared. Promotion from within, so that you actually not only hire people who know something about the company, but more than that, if I continually go outside to hire executive talent, what message have I sent to you? You're not good enough. Having told you you are not good enough, you will either leave the company or retire in place, which is something even worse. Share information. Open book management. Jack Stack wrote a book called The Great Game of Business. There's also a book called Open Book Management. If you want people to make good decisions, they have to know the data.